able to embrace that and work on myself came first. So it came to like uh, learning to love myself and learning to be really gentle with myself instead of uh, trying to be the person who needs to bear all of the brunt of the problems in the relationship. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy. Welcome to episode 112. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have an interview with Jamie. She identifies as Solo Polly and reached out to us a little bit ago to actually talk about our story, but also promote a lot of the amazing work she does. Yeah, it's definitely not a sales pitch in any way, but she works with quite a few uh, different groups around, actually around the world, uh, but specifically in California as well, doing community building and really promoting sex positivity. And you'll hear the organization that she talks a little bit about is, again, it's in California or the the sort of the chapter she's a part of is in California, but they have uh, chapters all over the world and they're looking to grow and build more. So this is a, it's a really great episode for anybody who's looking for community and yeah, and her story is phenomenal as well. And it's, and we're, we're super happy she came on to share it. One thing we wanted to apologize to her for really quick. And I guess to the listeners as well, she talks about an event that she hosted, uh, on the 21st of February. And you may know that this is after the 21st of February. <laughs> so we apologize that we weren't able to get this out in time to get everybody to that event. But she hosts these events uh, periodically. And so you can check out her website to find out when the next one is and definitely check them out and help her boost those numbers up. You can find her website and contact information as well as other information about our guests on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. And you can also get there by clicking the little button for show notes underneath uh, your podcast here in your podcast player. Yes, ma'am. All right. Tonight, we've got some fun stuff going on. Few announcements as normal. First up, uh, I'm going to shake it up a little bit, reorder them. Um, oh, you're so crazy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't know how you do it week after week. So you may have noticed we have episodes coming out on Fridays as well right now. Last Friday was an episode on sexual health. And this Friday is an episode on consent with Ginger and the Prof of Life on the Swing Set and Intellectual Foreplay Podcast. We have a super fun conversation. So come back on Friday and listen to that. And as I tried to talk about a second ago, we have something fun happening tonight that you can all participate in. We do. We have our monthly annual... <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, our monthly annual, our monthly annual weekly daily Patreon calls. Just a way to confuse them. <laughs> it's they're our, actually monthly. They're actually monthly. Once a month, we do a live video Q and A for all of the Patreon supporters. You can join now. Come on tonight and be part of this awesome conversation. Uh, it's been growing every month for the last eight months or so, and we have a ton of fun. So check out again in the show notes. There's links to join that or on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. And we hope to see you there. And thank you to all of our existing patrons for your support. We're so grateful to have you part of the community and to be helping us build uh, an awesome group of people that can hang out every month and chat. Yeah. No, we're excited. We love these Q&As. All right. Last thing. What do we got? Custom fit condoms. My one condoms. You've heard about us talk about this a lot lately, but we love these condoms. They come in 60 sizes and you can go to their website and print off a little measuring tool and measure yourself and order. She's your talking about your penis. Yep. <laughs> if, you, if you have one or maybe you're good friends with somebody who has one, you can help them measure theirs. Yeah. Make it a group activity. Go get, for it. Get 10 of them together, measure them all, and then order all of them and get 20% off using the offer code. NNM podcast. For those who didn't catch how fast she said that, <laughs> that's NNM podcast, and it's in the show notes. You won't miss it. And yeah, definitely support them. They do amazing work, and they are out there promoting sexual health and doing it in a way that fits everybody's penis. 
Yep. And Not- I mean, I guess you could put it on a toy as well if you wanted. Definitely. Custom yeah. fit. You just have to measure the toy with the measuring tool. Sure. Why not? All right. <laughs> check them out. They're awesome. We use them every time we have sex. Anyway, go check them out. And now let's go talk to Jamie. So, well, welcome, Jamie, to the show. We're excited to have you. It's been a while trying to get this one set up, so our, our apologies on that. But Yeah, that was on our end. <laughs> yeah, it's on our end. Holidays are crazy around here, right? So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So you do quite a bit of work in the non-monogamous and polyamorous communities around the Southern California, LA, greater LA area. And uh, we definitely want to give you a chance to talk about all that. But maybe uh, before you get into the details of that, do you mind sharing a little background on who you are and how you got involved in non-monogamy to begin with? That, that might be a long story. Perfect. Is we've got, okay? we've got time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Um, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, I spend most of my time volunteering or working with uh, the sex positive community and uh, polyamory is a huge portion of that. The way I got started actually was I had a boyfriend and not the best relationship. And he basically introduced me to the concept because I had in my head from a you know Christian background, from my family, from my settings, growing up in the suburbs, just that you're supposed to be straight. We're kind of starting to accept uh, people who were gay. Bisexual was kind of not really something we talked about. And every relationship was supposed to be monogamous. So it was after getting into college that I realized that maybe there were other options out there. And I was very not into it. I was not okay with it. But uh, my boyfriend, you know, he pushed on it, he pushed on it, and eventually he tried it. And I thought it was great. He did not. <laughs> and that didn't end well. So, so you, you, know, you went into it not wanting to do it, but you then loved it after that? Yeah, I was like, oh, this is really cool to be able to connect with people because I had always kind of, I put like a little bit of a wall up with people like, oh, this is my boyfriend. I'm supposed to be really dependent on my boyfriend. Like, I definitely had some ideas about relationships that everything's supposed to come from that partner and not from your, your friends. And that was a big shift for me to realize that you could have that kind of love from more than one person. I was like, oh, this is really cool. And he was like, hey, you're supposed to need me. So there's a lot of other toxic relationship stuff going on, like like happens when you're young. That was yeah. in my early 20s. After that relationship ended, I started specifically seeking people who called themselves polyamorous with really no idea what that meant. Because um, I'm, I'm guessing you talk about this on your show. Basically, things are different when you're polyamorous in terms of like the level of communication you need to have, the emotional awareness that you need to have of yourself. And I didn't have that, even though we were both open. And um, we we were doing a lot of drugs, if I'm honest, and um, just kind of swinging more than anything. Yeah. And um, I decided that was not the lifestyle for me. Met somebody through the Sex Positive community who took me to Sex Positive LA that really heavily taught consent and boundaries. And then I also started going to a polyamory discussion group that I found through FetLife. And what's great about that is a lot of times when you're in this space of looking for other partners, people pretty immediately want to go, okay, then come back to our place. Let's get naked. And you're like, wait, I thought we were on a date and we were all getting to know each other. So it uh, introduced me to a community of people who are polyamorous. And I suddenly was realizing that uh, I had other toxic things in my relationships, either uh, the communication wasn't good enough really to bring in other partners or I was feeling really insecure about things needed to work on myself more. I also had a tendency to be really an enabler to my partners and had to work on that emotionally for me to make sure I was showing up in the best way. And uh, just through having a community, that's really what brought me to where I'm at now where I'm in an open relationship with my partner. Um, I'm an ethical slut as in, Uh, I'm a free agent. I do what I do with my people and I lead groups because it keeps me in the know of what's happening in terms of health and law and everything else that affects people who, uh, you don't fall into the space that's less typical, less protected, like, like polyamorous relationships are not protected by the law when kids get involved, for example, these are little things that you learn along the way. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
that's the really fast version of my story. So, so yeah. would you say what you're practicing <laughs> then is generally solo, solely, solo so, polyamory? Yeah, definitely. Be- because of that code, I used to get really codependent with my partners where I was really like, you know, you're supposed to take care of me. You're supposed to give me everything I need. And, um, you know, you be the prince, I'll be the princess. And realizing that I needed to take care of me first uh, brought me to solo poly and just being like, oh, I'm dating me first. And I'm the most important thing in this relationship because if I'm not taken care of, the relationship doesn't get taken care of. So that's been uh, helpful for me to show up in the right way in my relationship. Yeah. So right. definitely solo poly. And yeah. do you mind sharing how old you are now just for some context? Okay. okay. Perfect. Yeah. Same so as Emma. Yeah, same as me, actually. Uh, So you've been, it's safe to say, like, from that, it's been at least a decade since you really started that road-ish, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe a little bit less, because that first relationship stayed pretty monogamous for a while and then shifted over. But yeah, Yeah. about a decade. Yeah. Cool. So I'm I'm wondering if, like, if you can maybe think back to when you first started talking about this or your partner brought it up in college and you were kind of like, no way, definitely not for me. And then there was this shift, right? And I think there's a lot of people who are still at that point. They're, maybe their partner brought it up or they heard about it or they're hearing this right now and they're like, no way, not a chance in hell. What, I guess, can you maybe talk through like what sort of shifted for you and how, like, how did that look? What were some of the things you were scared about? And then what were maybe the realities versus what you were scared about? Um, I was scared of a few things and some of them did come true. Um, for one, I was scared of being replaced. Like, um, if my partner has a new partner, they're going to choose them instead of me. So that was a big one. And that one actually did happen with that boyfriend. So that was a legitimate fear, but I'm also happy that happened because God, I don't want to be this with somebody who's just going to replace you. Right. And there is a, a fear also of like, what are they doing together? Are they doing things that like, are better than the things that I'm doing. Is it, are they forming a special connection and I'm not a part of it? Is that okay? Like uh, a lot of uh, ruminating in my head about what was happening when I'm not in the room. I feel like that's pretty that was, that was common, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I think when, when you think about think opening your relationship mm-hmm. and that it's just, it's a leap for a lot of people to make because you get in your head yeah. about that. Yeah. And then uh, when I, like for early partners before I really learned to be more open and really ask questions, it was, are they even having a good time with them? Are like, are they going to get back to me and be in a shitty mood? Cause that, when that happens, it's not fun to be surprised by that. So that, that lesser so, but more thinking about like, what are they up to when they're not with me? And obviously they have something I don't have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, and I guess then maybe the the second half of that question is like, how did you work through some of those things and come around to being like, okay with it or that this is great. I'm really excited about this. And it sounds like it wasn't like an overnight thing, probably. No, definitely not overnight. For one, when I ended that relationship, there was a, there was a recognition for me that maybe I'm not doing this relationship thing right because this one was did not end well. So um, like my first thing was really acknowledging that it, that I had very low self-esteem and that's okay. <laughs> Cause I did not want to be labeled as somebody who needed low self, who had low self-esteem or had problems. I had a big issue be, being labeled in any way, but being able to embrace that and work on myself came first. So it came to like, uh, learning to love myself and learning to be really gentle with myself instead of uh, trying to be the person who needs to bear all of the brunt of the problems in the relationship to instead say, well, I can forgive myself for this relationship. I can forgive myself for getting things wrong because that love wasn't just about um, relationships and polyamory. It was just about building myself up so that I was showing up in the best way. And that's why I ended up as a solo poly person. It really suits me because uh, I'm not always the best about taking care of myself and this makes me take care of myself. Right. Yeah. Um, well, and I think too, when, when you start taking care of yourself, right, you, some of those fears of, well, what if they replace me or what if they find somebody better or what if they're having fun with this other person, right? Some of those fears start to dissolve because it's, it's okay because you know, you can do those things as well. And that mm-hmm. it's, 
And that doesn't mean, I guess, that just because you're having fun with person A, it means you had less fun with person B or that if they do leave you for person X, Y, or Z, right? That doesn't mean there was something inherently wrong with you. And maybe it was just not the right situation, right? And it's, I guess it all just comes back to that taking care of yourself and taking care of you first. And yeah. Yeah. I was also recognizing that just because someone has a sexual connection doesn't mean that that relationship is more important. Because I, I definitely thought of it that way because of the monogamy mindset that I got. So if two people are having sex, it's a special relationship and it's more important than a friendship. It's more important than your coworkers. And instead of being able to say, no, it's not more important or it's, I don't have to be jealous of a friend because like I have a partner who um, loves doing improv comedy and loves uh, riffing on things and making references. Not my jam. Love when his friends are around who love to do that with him because uh, he gets it out of the system and gets to have fun. And it's not something I'm going to do. And I started thinking of uh, other partners that way where it's like, you know, it's great that they can bring something out of my partner that doesn't light me up because at the end of the day, we're all different people. Right. Yeah. And that you don't have to fill every single one of your partner's needs if if they're allowed to have other relationships, be it sexual, romantic or otherwise that can come mm -hmm. in and take some of that, even if it's just good friends. Right. Yeah. 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 Are you fairly um, out in your community about your path and different relationship styles? Uh, no, definitely. Um, so about two years ago, I, uh, in my local community, took over a meetup group uh, that's a sex positive group. And pretty much every time we have an orientation or an event, we introduce ourselves. And I introduced myself with the pronoun she, her. Uh, as an ethical slut who's polyamorous and a relationship anarchist or whatever is there at the time. So um, to all of my friends, to my sisters and everybody, I'm very out about it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's super exciting. Have Have you seen a shift in the way that it like feels for you since you've been able to be out and open about it? Yeah. That? Yeah, it, it's like releasing anything that you're ashamed of or uh, or me, like a, a fear of being misunderstood is it's uh, better to be misunderstood and work on it than just live with the fear of it because you end up in your head like, are people going to judge me? What's going to happen? And uh, uh, I've uh, thankfully gotten a lot of understanding and space to uh, be myself and not be uh, too judged for it. Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. ask is that are people pretty open and maybe ask questions, but ultimately supportive? Yeah. And of course, um, you run into a lot with folks where um, th there's a lot of like, oh, that's great for you. It's not for me. Where I'm yeah. like, I, I really didn't ask if it was for you, <laughs> like, but yeah, okay. That's okay. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So sometimes people say things and they kind of trip over themselves. And I'm like, oh, you know, that's this is progress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 At yeah. least they're not shaming you yeah. <laughs> necessarily. Yeah. 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 I was also wondering if, if maybe you'd be willing to talk a little bit about exploring non-monogamy from the perspective of maybe not necessarily the single female, but the, the perspective of a, a solo poly female where you're not necessarily partnered with a, a man or anybody and trying to do this together, but you're out doing this on your own, right? That's a little bit of a, a different dynamic. Not, I guess it's not, not a different dynamic, but there can be some challenges there, right? Where maybe people assume because you're polyamorous, all you want is to hook up and have sex and you're just, you're just easy. Right. And there's a lot of myths that go around mm -hmm. even, even labeling yourself as a, an ethical slut and maybe just talking through some of the sort of the challenges and maybe on the flip side, some of the benefits of sort of where you're at with that. I find that I'm having to do a lot of coaching with new people because it's, it's damn near impossible for me to date in um, what I tend to call the muggle world because I'm also part of the BDSM and kink community, which is not to say every relationship needs to involve that, but it's uh, something that gets a lot of attention. So I tend to have to go looking for partners in spaces that are already very open. That's one way it affects me. Um, so thankfully I, tend to run good folks uh, who understand that I'm not just looking to hook up. I actually like to get to know them. 
Um, on top of it, I tend to define things like, you know, if we're here together right now, that's enough. You also, I, they, I don't have a lot of expectations of people like contacting me every day or needing to check in on me and things like that. I'm like, if I need you, I'll call you. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of expectations that come with things where people are like, well, we went on a date, so we need to keep checking in and doing all of these things. Um, I, I really worked on kind of the scripts that society can hand you of things that you're supposed to do if you're a good girlfriend or boyfriend. And um, asking myself when I would start doing things with people, like, why am I doing this? Why do I feel like I need to show up as this person for somebody? Why do I feel like I need to answer these text messages when I'm too tired? Why do I feel like I need to have a phone call with this person when I don't want to? Or uh, why do I feel like I need to say yes to getting together when I don't want to? And, And that's a process. And that's part of the sex positive community as well is learning how to say no to people and also to be told no and be cool about it because we tend to live in a society where we push on each other. So, uh, does that answer your question? I feel like that was a kind of complicated answer. (laughs) No, it's a great answer. And I think (laughs) maybe I touched on something else there around the being comfortable saying no and also like accepting a no. And those are some things that I guess they've been recent themes that we've kind of come across. Yeah. That we talked about a little bit on our show. Yeah. And I think maybe ways that you can, you know, Ask, maybe we'll call it consent, right? Ask for consent. Ask somebody out. Ask if they're interested in something. Gracefully accept their no. And then also make them feel like they can give a no, right? Those are, mm-hmm. that's a that's a tricky. It's a skill set, yeah, honestly, a, to, to learn how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in my community, uh, what they teach everybody is we basically practice this face to face because of course, hearing it is one thing, doing it is a completely different animal. And that is we, you get face to face with somebody ask for something like a hug. So can I give you a hug? And the person just says, no. And you say, thank you for taking care of yourself. And the reason we practice it like that is for one to teach the person saying no, you don't have to explain yourself. You don't have to feel sorry for them. You don't have to take care of them. No is a complete sentence. And for two, thank you for taking care of yourself is about. Um, Sometimes I don't like to be hugged, especially if I'm in work mode, or maybe I don't feel good. Maybe I'm fighting off a cold and you don't want to be in my airspace. Uh, By someone saying thank you for taking care of yourself, they're not internalizing my no. What's wrong with me? Why are they a no to me? What did I do? I smell funny. And those things that happen in your head when you're told no. And um, it's it's been a really healing process to do that pretty constantly. And um, spaces like uh, there's a lot of people who do like cuddle events. Like out here, we have a place called Cuddle Sanctuary, and that's a great space to pr- practice that with people. Yeah. Can you yeah. just for the listeners who don't know explain what is the Cuddle Sanctuary? Because that's something that I think is not as common. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people have heard about platonic cuddles. So basically, the idea is. If you want touch in American society, you go on a date, you touch maybe a family member, but most of us are very touch deprived and only get sex from a sexual part or sorry, touch from a sexual partner. So um, in these spaces, it's platonic cuddles only and cuddle sanctuary is a model that you can find all over the country. Um, Basically, we practice consent. So we teach everyone to say no and thank you for taking care of yourself and all this, but we can keep everything platonic. So there's no uh, clothes coming off. There's no uh, anyone gra- grabbing anywhere that's inappropriate. Like a kid could walk in the room and it'd be totally innocent. And um, you teach people to ask for what they want. And so you can go up to someone and say, hi, can I put my, can I rub your back? Can I lay against you? Can we spoon together? And knowing that person can say no to you. In fact, they may have said no to you in an opening exercise. You really know when you're hearing yes, it's a yes. And the other thing we teach people is uh, maybe you've been cuddling for a while. I tend to tweak my neck in some positions. So we also kind of go, okay, I'm full. I I need to reposition. And um, it's helped me a lot to ask for touch that I want and to... uh, be able to keep myself comfortable when moving around with different folks. Touch is also very healing and good for you. Like it really uses oxytocin. It, it makes you feel better. Like 
humans are community-based creatures. We really just need touch. And a lot of people who end up, uh, in my opinion, with like the constant drive to go and hook up and find people, a lot of times would be good with a cuddle. Like they could really be good with just some, you know, arms locked together and that would be enough because what's really going on is they're not getting their touch needs met. Yeah. No, I think that's an amazing point and the it's very intriguing concept to me because something that we have not experienced, um, yeah. at least not a platonic, yeah, well, cuddle, like the cuddle sanctuary like that, but I'll have to check it out. I was going to say, we platonically <laughs> cuddle all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you're close to it now that you're in California. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Very true. Um, so I'm, I just wondered if also you could maybe talk a little bit about it. Sounds like you found a lot of really great communities, right? Let's yeah. call it the, the cuddle community. The BDSM community, the poly community, it sounds like you dabbled a little bit in the the swinging community for mm. for a time, and you've kind of like dipped your toes or jumped all the way into lots of different communities. And maybe just talking a little bit about some of the transformations you've seen for yourself along the way. I mean, we talked a little bit about you know you had to focus on yourself and you had to put yourself mm-hmm. first, but like what have some of these transformations looked like for you, like in a like tangible sense almost if that makes sense yeah so i i mentioned i used to be in a relationship where we were doing drugs so that's a big shift um i got into a lot of mindfulness practices uh so really not allowing the outside world to define what's going on in my inner world and then other things started shifting externally so um the big differences in me are, for one, I have extreme self-confidence uh, that just did not exist before. I'm constantly doing public speaking and things like this where I'm, I'm just uh, really wanting to be clear that normal people are polyamorous and normal people do kink and normal people can live this way in uh, more tribe-like environments too. I uh, just got back from vacation. This is probably a great one uh, with Sex Positive World where we all went to Maui, about 24 of us, and had a week-long vacation with people who are all over the spectrum in these communities, all of it being the sex positive, because sex positive is all of these uh, together. So we were doing workshops about cuddles and what's going on with sex workers and things like that, just uh, enjoying each other's touch and getting to know each other. And then also, like, we went whale watching one day, like 11 of us, and just were surrounded by whales, like... Uh, it's an amazing thing to be surrounded by a community of people where you're completely out of the closet. There's no secrets. You can talk to them about family drama. You can talk to them about relationship problems. You can talk to them about how everything's going great for you, how everything's not going great, and also how you had sex with five people last week. And there's no judgment. You can just be really open about it. And, um, They've also given me space to grow as a person as I go, you know, I don't think that this thing in my life serves me anymore. Maybe I need to make a shift in my career. And the fact that we're also very open with each other, even if we're not involved as a relationship or sexually, that there's an understanding that we're all human and that this is healthy, natural, and normal. Yeah. Wow. That sounds amazing. (laughs) Um, I, if someone out there is searching for these types of communities. Do you have any recommendations where they might start to find them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll start with Sex Positive World because they're a group of people, I think, who have been the most there for me and uh, are like a big tribe. We're in a bunch of different cities. So sexpositiveworld.com will show you all of them, but we're in Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, Reno, San Francisco, uh, also in like Belgium. We just had a new chapter start in Phoenix. So if you get on Meetup, you could also find us there. So if you go looking for um, sex positive people, you you can find us basically. There's lots of different subgroups and stuff too, but I, I think they're one of the greatest resources that's in a lot of American cities. Yeah. I don't know if you ever talked about FetLife.com. FetLife, like fetish life, uh, is also a great one to find events and communities. That's where I found the polyamory support group that was in my little town. 
because we didn't have much up here until I decided to start organizing and then it blew up. Yeah. Uh, so that's also a great place to find it, especially if you're looking for fetish and kink. Yeah. Well, and it's, I think it's awesome to note too, that you don't necessarily have to be into fetish and kink to find things on there that would, you would like. Yeah. Um, but then if you do, that's kind of just a bonus if you're into that as well. So, um, I think people, some people see the word fat life or hear about what the site is all about. And sometimes they're like, oh, that's not for me, but really I'm looking for community and that could be a really good place to go. Yeah, totally. It's because it's a lot more like a Facebook than a hookup site. Like there's so many events and people post photos and stay in contact with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so something that, that we like to talk about as well, and uh, again, the coming, maybe a not to keep like singling you out like you're this special specimen here, but the <laughs> right like navigating the safety both sexual and just like physical safety in in the world of polyamory, BDSM, kink, cuddling, I suppose even like just like navigating that as a as a solo woman or as a solo female is that I guess maybe some steps you've taken to keep yourself safe throughout the last you know six or seven years of exploring. For one, I got connected to a community. Um, if, if a person will meet you at a community event, that's a good sign. <laughs> right. Um, right. Like people will also throw some red flags just when you're messaging them. If you can't make a joke and they laugh it off, if you can't say no over text and they get mad, like the, the, people will reveal themselves pretty quickly if you give them a little test. I've never had an interaction with a stranger from the internet go wrong i've had them be disappointing but never go wrong and it's because i do things like that i make sure that uh, they understand consent um for two if people a lot of people though are not comfortable meeting at community events because uh they want to go on a date they don't want to go on a date with you and all of your friends <laughs> so meeting in public is one that we all talk about when meeting people from the internet let somebody know where you are. If you have a photo and a phone number and an address, even better. I just tried out an app recently called Safe Date, um, which you can actually set it up for it to call people and send that information to your friends if you don't want to let them know in advance. Uh, I've actually never had it go off because, I, like I said, I've never had a problem, but it seems like a good resource. Um, when it comes to the scene, and I'm talking you know, kink um, or events where touching is involved, like a cuddle, there should always, 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 never, if you're going to an event that doesn't have this, don't go. There should always be an opening circle where everyone introduces themselves and they agree to something like this. Consent means no means no, and once is enough. <laughs> Maybe is not yes. <laughs> right. Uh, confidentiality that no one's going to talk about seeing you there. No one's, and they're not going to come stalking you after either, like talking to you on the, on the internet, they'll talk to you in person. Um, that's part of consent, I guess. And then that you're encouraged to take care of yourself, not others. And hopefully, no, actually there should always be somebody in the room who's more of like a care counselor, or if you're in a dungeon, a dungeon monitor, someone where if something goes wrong and you need help, there's a sober ready person there to help you out. Um, when it comes to safety in dungeons, every kink has different safety standards. My kink of choice is rope. I really like being tied up. I really like tying others. So like, for example, we always have trauma shears or a hook knife nearby because people, if you can't breathe, you need them out right now. If people are practicing needle play, they need a certain set of sterilization tools on hands at all time. So every kink is something that really should, you should go to a class about it or meet someone who really knows what they're doing, who's a master in the subject already, because we do things that are dangerous and that's very fun, but it's still something that where it could cause permanent damage or loss of life. And then your last question was about STIs and risk in that way. Um, Planned Parenthood is an amazing resource. Uh, I, I say that as somebody who's actually hosted one of their STI panels. And the thing is, barriers are great. And understanding what your risk profile is, is great. And being able to have a safer sex talk is great. So it's everything from, uh, if you've ever heard of uh, Reed Mahalka, he does a great safer sex elevator speech. Um, and Evelyn 
uh, Decker does a talk. It's like a STARS talk, which I like because it's an acronym. It's your STI status, your uh, what your, uh, your turn-ons are, your avoids, your relationship expectations, and just kind of STI etiquette. Like, don't call people dirty. That's not cool. Um, and also don't freak out if they're positive for something. <laughs> uh, so, um, I, I personally, I use barriers with new people. I always talk to them when they were last tested. I get tested myself quarterly. I'm just really open with people and expect the same. If someone is a uh, cagey with me about when they were tested or don't know what they were tested for, I don't have sex with that person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and no. Planned Parenthood does testing for free. So, go get tested and then we can do the sex later. Right. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And those are a lot of really good resources. Yeah. No, yeah. Thank, you, thank you for mentioning them all. And yeah, we, we greatly appreciate it. I'd say too, a, a thing to keep in mind is just, um, we tend to live in a culture of scarcity. Like if, if you don't have the thing that the person, like if someone's offering you some sexy thing that you think is so great and you've always wanted to try, but they don't know when they were tested. It can be really tempting to just go ahead and do that, that thing. So the other part of this is to start understanding that it's okay to say no, someone will offer it again in the future, or you can ask for it. Because a lot of times we don't ask for what we want. So when it is offered, we feel like we have to say yes. Right. And pay attention to when you think to yourself, I have to say yes. Right. That's yeah. a great time to say no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And the the scarcity mindset versus the abundance mindset is something that that we love to talk about as well. And I think yeah. when you see this come up often, I would say often when people start swinging for the first time because oh, yeah. they're like, okay, we're going to go out to our club the first time. We're going to go meet a couple, right? Or we're going to go to a club or yeah, it's a first date. And you think to yourself, well, it's crazy that we're here. I'm not, I don't really believe that my partner wants to be here, even though they've said they want to be here. They probably don't believe I want to be here because this stuff's so crazy. So we better make it happen tonight because this could all go up in smoke tomorrow. Yeah. And so it's that like limiting belief that this is the one and only time you'll ever get to do any of these things. And as you sort of kind of, you go through time, right? And you realize that you'll have this opportunity again. You'll have that opportunity again. You don't, you don't have to do it with the first person who asks or the first time it comes up. Like it, Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll come around again. It might, it might be a while, but it'll come around again and you'll never know who you might find that would be interested in that if you're willing to, yeah, like you said, ask about it. Yeah. And the asking, I think is the really big one. Um, uh, we have a practice in my group also of constantly sharing fantasies just to get used to talking about the fantasies because, you know, going to your partner and being like, Hey, I think he, I think I want you to like lick my feet. That's not a comfortable thing to just ask for. So you have to <laughs> kind of get used to making a time and place to talk about it. Have right. those conversations that might yeah. take a little time and a little bit of maybe finesse. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is are, are there things that you've explored and you don't, I guess maybe don't have to be like super graphic about it if you don't want to be, but like, are there things that you've explored over the last seven years, you know, whether it's maybe your sexuality or just anything that you never thought you would, you know, 10 years ago or when you, you know, growing up being, like you said, conservative Christian background? Mm-hmm. Well, when I started that relationship with that boyfriend, I was like leading the Christian youth band. I was, you know, <laughs> really good girl, very vanilla. So everything I have done is outside of the norm for me. So I had no idea I would enjoy having groups of people to have in my sex life. I had no idea that like running relationships parallel could be so wonderful. Um, I really love checking in with like my lady friends and comparing stories and uh, that's really not something I used to do at all yeah I never thought I would be into kink I found that community when I started going to the polyamory discussion group because lo and behold the fet life group was full of kinksters <laughs> <laughs> so I never I certainly didn't think I would ever start tying people up for fun I never thought I would be tied for fun and you know, yeah, a lot of people start on one side of the slash or the other they go oh I would only ever do this one thing and a few months go by and get curious about the other thing. So yeah, there's been a lot along the way. And a lot of times I find when you're thinking one day, 
That's so weird. Why do people even like that? Six months later, you probably would like that thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's how life is, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 It sounds like you're in a wonderful place in your life. It's, and yeah. it's, you have let yourself grow and allowed your, I guess, giving yourself permission to go seek what suits you and what fits you, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing because I think that so many people out there struggle with that, right? It's hard to let go. And especially if you're, if you feel stuck in some sort of situation. Yeah. Um, I'd say a lot of people spend their lives feeling very stuck. And the thing is, um, it gets uncomfortable. You usually have to do something that pushes on personal boundaries or on traumas, or I I oftentimes call them survival patterns where people just keep go, Oh, I want to do that. But then they don't do that. And I go back to the thing I used to do. And I'll go in a little cycle at all times. But if you want to like try polyamory, that is terrifying. If you've never done it before, like, and that's part of why, like, going to a social is a great place to start because there's no expectations. So just taking a push towards the uncomfortable, I think, is really important to get to a place where relationships are something you enjoy and not something that you're dreading, you know. Yeah. I, I've definitely been in the situation where I've lived with uh, someone I called a boyfriend but was really my roommate, and I never want to do that ever again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so something you you said earlier is something that we've encouraged people to do quite a bit, which is you said there was nothing in my area until I started it and then it blew up and took off, right? Yeah, I was just going to say that too. (laughs) And so one of the things we encourage people to do if they're like, well, I live in rural, let's just say Idaho, and there's nothing here, or rural Iowa, or rural wherever. Rural. (laughs) Rural, right? Or just we're we're not near a big city. Or even if we are near a big city, I don't want to drive 30 minutes into the city, right? Right. What are the what are the things that you think made your group super successful? Because I think that's something that Well maybe first outline like yeah, what, what are your what groups? you have created. First. Yeah, what what have you created and why has it been successful? So Sex Positive is the group I started here. So I live in the eight oh five area code, so mine's called Sex Positive eight oh five. And down in Los Angeles there's Sex Positive LA or SPLA. So we're separate, but we're all under the same umbrella group. So I'd say that's a great place to start. But what I like about Sex Positive is it has some rules. So we do a monthly orientation to lay out what the rules are. And um, we use our local LGBT center to actually present that. There's actually a lot of people in this industry who are willing to support communities like this. Because we also had it through um, a local lingerie store that wanted to encourage education and sex positivity. But we lay out a few rules. One is, I, I talked about them earlier, it's the three C's. Care, take care of yourself first. You're not here to take care of other people. That's second confidentiality. Don't talk about what other people are doing here. Talk about your own yummy experience. And also we say, and if you run into each other out in public, just ignore each other. You don't know who they're with. And then uh, consent, the no means no, once is enough. It's an enthusiastic, informed, revocable, you know, fries consent. For two, we put our events on levels, um, which isn't really about like, you know, leveling up because you got to get the bonus. It's about uh, like what to expect when you get there. A level one event being like a discussion group or someone teaching or uh, a munch or a slosh for people getting together to eat or to drink. Um, level two is where we have touch, but it's very platonic. It's very G-rated, like our cuddles. And that could also include, a, I do a workshop called Getting in Touch with Touch, which is like just being able to get in touch with your own sense of touch because we kind of forget how to tune into that. Um, we have level three, which is clothes can come off, but there's no fluid exchange and there's no penetration and we're not seeking an orgasm. A lot of tantric work happens at this level and massage. This is a hard level for a lot of people because we tend to want to rush into intercourse. This is a yummy space to remind you, you don't have to do that. (laughs) Uh, I, I see a lot of healing happen for people in that space when they realize that they don't have to go to the sex right away. 
Um, and then we have level four, which is we teach people how to have a safer sex talk. They've been with us for a while. So we know they have a sense of community and they're capable of saying no. So they're not going to like a pelvic floor workshop, you know, just like whatever, anybody can touch me. I'm fine. We, we don't like that energy in the room. We want to know that you're going to say no. If you're at a level four event, you realize you don't have to take your clothes off. You don't have to touch anybody. You could sit in the kitchen and just watch. <laughs> So that's the other part that keeps us really safe. Like we've never had like uh, any major consent violations because they happen at a very low level with people before they have a chance to really hurt somebody. And also people don't stick around who are just looking to hook up. We end up building a really strong community that way. So if you're looking to start something yourself, it's good to have some strict rules about what your boundaries are. Second off, I don't host events unless I want to do them. <laughs> uh, I really like tying rope. I really like that's one of my favorite things. So I host a rope social. I found out what needed to be done to establish safety in the same way. because ro- And then we had to talk about the safety risk on top of those things I just mentioned. And um, that's why we have it. I found the space to do it. And... Um, by vetting people through an orientation that also meant the people coming through the door were safe people. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. And then you also run a speed dating as well, correct? That's right. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? Because I think we've probably heard a a bunch of different variations on speed dating and some of them much more successful than others. How, how does yours work? And I guess, how is it, how, like, how has it been received? Um, it's been received really well. My biggest problem is getting people to know what's happening because uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a brand new entrepreneur because I went from doing this strictly as volunteer work to, oh, th- there's there's a market for this that's not being served. Uh, so poly speed dating, um, which is very much so LGBT speed dating, um, is designed for people who are in non-traditional romantic relationships. So you can come in as a single person person you come in as a couple you come in as a morsum totally up to you you just have to date that way the whole night and then we set people up based on what they're attracted to so if you're a couple who's just looking for a man you'll just talk to men all night or if you're you don't want to talk to couples you only want to talk to singles then you'll only talk to singles that night so it's based on the gender you're attracted to and like the size the amount of people you want to talk to and how do you run the speed dating piece like is do you give people canned questions? Do you just let them have a conversation? So what I do is we start, I give a like a little o- opening speech for it. Um, we do, what is it? Eight minutes at eight rounds, which seems to be just a skosh too long and a skosh too short for some people. So I feel like it's the sweet spot. Um, so you get eight minutes with each person and I do put cards on the table to start conversations. And I don't think I've seen them used once. <laughs> People tend to launch right into a conversation because there's also just a little bit of social time beforehand. I think people kind of give each other the eyes across the room and, you know, know what they want to launch into. But a lot of people are like, well, send me messages being like, well, I'm an introvert and I won't know what to talk about. So I put these cards on the table so they would know what to talk about and no one uses them. But, Maybe next but they're time. there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And are they pretty well pretty well attended? I mean, it sounds like you've got some pretty big groups coming out. Yeah. Um, on average, we have about 30 people. I'd really like to see that get up to 40 to 60 just to get a little more variety. Yeah. Um, things like this are helpful because the biggest problem is that people are like, wait, that's, I, I want to go to that. <laughs> they And they don't realize it's happening. Right. And so that's in the Burbank area, right? Yeah, I do them. Um, the next one is in Glendale in February. It's on the Friday the 21st. I've done them at, um, also in Calabasas. I might do one up in Ventura. But basically, they they move around Los Angeles because um, it can take a long time to get across town. So people love it when it's on their side of town. Yeah, 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 yeah that makes sure. sense. Yeah. And where yeah. can people find information about that if they're curious? Yeah. Um, so my brand is called given consent. Like if you're given consent, you could do all kinds of ravenous things to somebody. <laughs> and, um, I go to given consent.org slash poly speed dating. Um, you can also find me on Instagram and on Facebook. I'm not the best, but consistently posting, but all the information is on there. Yeah. And that's under uh, given consent as well. 
Yes, all, it's all given consent. Perfect. Yeah. And we'll and for anybody listening who was feverishly writing that down, we will make sure to put links <laughs> in the show notes, and uh, we'll make it easy to find you because that's a great resource okay. for people looking to get out and build community and yeah, see how it's done. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I have one last question. We often like to ask our guests if they have a funny blooper that has happened to them in some sort of, can be really pretty much anything, um, relationship dynamic. Basically to show that this isn't all super serious. Cuddle party. (laughs) Yeah. That basically that we're all human and mistakes happen. (laughs) So I, I have one person I call my partner right now. And um, we were going up to visit Sex Positive San Francisco because I was teaching a class called Bedroom Bondage. And it was also Folsom Street Fair. And when I was on the phone with the organizers who live up there because they are giving us a place to stay, I just started calling him my partner. Now I'm a relationship anarchist, which means I, I don't do the relationship escalator, which is to say, I don't assume anything is on the table unless you tell me. I don't assume I'm going to meet your family just because we're partners. Like ev- everything's very clinical for me. I want to know what th- that means to somebody. And that's pretty much where I was at with this person. So we got up there to San Francisco having, I, we had never talked about calling each other partners and I'm introducing the class for bedroom bondage. And I talked about myself and my history with rope and what had everyone introduced themselves around the room and also explain their relationship with rope. And when it got to uh, Alex, who's my now partner, he was like, yeah, I came up here with Jamie and um, like, we're, we're together. At least I, th- I think you said that. And um, we checked in with each other later. We do monthly relationship check-ins. We pick a time and place to just check in about all the things that maybe we never talked about because that's what happens in life. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, uh, so are we partners? Because uh, what was going on? And I was like, oh, I need to know what the word partner means to you before I can call you a partner. And he was like, oh, my God. Because <sighs> he he had taken it as me, like, totally ignoring it and uh, just having, like, a problem. And I was just like, oh, no, we, I, I didn't want to assume that I could just call you that. Without talking and to you about off, it. Yeah. And I was like, and I had to have a conversation. So we had totally missed each other at some point. And, uh, it was, it was a real relief. And now we are partners because of that conversation instead of just letting it hang and be weird. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in front of was, people, right? <laughs> yeah. It was cause it was weird for a minute. It was like, so why didn't you just say I'm your partner? <laughs> it's like, Oh, cause I want to know what does that word mean? What do you, what does that mean? <laughs> Ah, communication. Yeah. <laughs> when we exactly. yeah. even when we do our best to be respectful of everybody's boundaries, sometimes we I don't I don't want to say we're overly respectful, but like obviously there can still be some miscues, right? And that's, that's yeah. kind of the fun with it. Yeah. No, that's huh. awesome. Well, we're partners still. Yes. Officially. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you for reaching out to us and uh, coming on the show. It was wonderful chatting and hearing more about the work you do. I think it's amazing to have ambassadors like you out in the community. So yeah, that's it's awesome. And and we learned about Sex Positive World, which we didn't. Yeah, we have not heard that one before. So that's super cool. Yeah. Um, circling back, sorry, one more thing about Sex Positive World is we want to start chapters in new cities and we have all kinds of resources for how to do your own orientation, how to do, how to set up your own chapter, how to host these things like a cuddle party. And on top of it, we'll send people to you. I could be one of them to come help you do it. So if that's something that you're just like, dang, I, I could, I could run a meetup group, right? you know, come, come, come talk to us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Very cool. Well, we'll, again, we'll put links in the show notes so people can get all that information because that's that's awesome oh. and will help will help pollinate the Funny. sex positive yeah. world. <laughs> How'd I do? Perfect. Nailed it. Good one. All right. Well, have a wonderful evening, Jamie. Thank you again for your time. We appreciate it, and we're super excited to get more of what you have out in the world. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Bye. Welcome back. Uh, thank you so much for Jamie for welcome reach- back. They were already there. We're back. Oh, well, welcome back. Okay. Welcome back, us. <laughs> I guess you're right. <laughs> we're back, <laughs> and welcome back. Welcome back, Emma. To the outro. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, 
Thank you to Jamie for reaching out to us. We had a wonderful time chatting with her and getting to know her story and all of the amazing things that she's doing in the community. And so thank you. to Thank you for doing all that work. As yes. Well. We appreciate it. It's and awesome. hopefully all of you use this as motivation to get out there and create and find the community that you want. Absolutely. We wanted to tie in one other thing really quick. Sexual health related. Condoms are amazing, especially the ones that fit customly, as they say. Did, did they say that? No. Nope. You definitely <laughs> just made that up. But it's still a great idea to get tested. And as you know, if you've listened, or maybe this is your very first time, our favorite place to do that is stdcheck.com. With using the links on our website, you can save $10 off your full STD panel, testing panel. And you go to a local lab corp or quest tenor, um, testing center and you're in and out in a couple of minutes and you get your results on your phone in like one to two business days yep we love it we use it just like we use the custom fit condoms and we wouldn't recommend it if we didn't so check it out thank you for supporting the show and doing that next week we have an interview but friday's first yes i know i was going to come back to fridays okay first off friday i only episode. interrupted you because Last week, I said, I think I started to do the next week, and you yelled at me for not this talking outro about is Wednesday. Getting very I know. Long I'm now. just telling you why I was okay. interrupting you. Friday. We have a Focus Friday episode. Check it out. We have a discussion with Ginger and the prof on consent. It's amazing. Please come back on Friday and check that one out. It's a fun discussion. On yes. No, it is. We we have a lot of fun with them. Um, you said that very seductively. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Don't get, don't get people's hopes up. <laughs> anyway, come back Friday. Next week, we have two people who are really, really excited to be episode 113. Uh, so they will be episode 113, and their names are Hazel and James. And we will see you on Friday. We will see them next week. And if you want to see all of our guests, go to normalizingnonmonogamy.com, scroll around, click around, and enjoy yourselves. Yeah. Not in that way. That's gross. Oh, my God. Jeez. And let's wrap it up already, would you? Oh, uh, you're in uh, rare form tonight. Thank you, <laughs> and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everyone, for listening.